Oh, there you are. All now, right. now we're live. Okay. Up North Journal is live now. All right, everybody. Hopefully that works. We should be up and running now. There we go. Okay, make sure you got your Let's audio down. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing well out there this weekend. I'm going to do a little Facebook sharing here real quick, and we will get on with tonight's show. we got a there lot go. to talk about. Yes, we do. It's been a good weekend. Did you have a good weekend? Yes, I did. How about yourself? It was okay. I, I dabbled outside in the outdoors a little bit. A little bit? Just a little. A little bit. For any of those of you not following on Facebook, you'll get to hear about the the weekend extravaganza. Ooh, is, is this true? Is this a true statement? My uh, lovely wife will be excited. What's up? It says here that Detroit uh, Alan Trammell is going to go into the Baseball Hall of Fame. No, it's about time. Wow. It is about time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, it was a good weekend, and uh, you had a good weekend, and Jason Radecki's on. Jason, you got uh, you got those uh, Your leverages there? Oh, no. Not the same audio again. Go back the way you were. Before last week, huh? Congr that doesn't make any sense. No, you know I don't. Should be. Mm hmm. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Let's see what. Uh, It's fine. Deb says it's fine. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Jason, if, uh, if it's bad on your end there. We're getting reports from other people that everything seems to be okay. Craig Holly, congrats on the double mic. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody else out there, chime in real quick on our audio here. We're still tweaking this new system, so let us know what you're hearing on your end out there, please. All right. All right. Um, good show tonight. Dan Anderson is on. Dan. You know what, Dan? I don't know about you, buddy, but uh, those Packers almost, almost became legendary. Brent Jackson says good there. Okay. All right. Craig Hawley says it's a little low. A little low. Okay. Let me bring it back up. What was that? Let's see there. How's does that right. sound a little better? Hopefully, Craig Holly's saying it's a little muffled. Okay, but that could be because we're not talking directly into the microphones. That could be very well. Could be. All right. All right. You ready to rock this thing? I'm ready. All right. Let's give her a whirl here, guys and gals. Stand by. Three, two, and one. Welcome back to another episode of the Emerald Journal, everybody. I'm your host, Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin tonight, Dan Defall. Beautiful weekend here in Michigan. I tell you what, it's a beautiful weekend. We got snow on the ground. You had snow in the UP. No, I was no, in uh, the <laughs> northern lower. I was in the. U I wasn't in the UP, but they got snow up there. But anyways, we're uh, in Michigan, Dan. We're, we're in, the lower in Michigan. Peninsula. <laughs> uh, I, I, my thoughts were. You're in the UP. Your mind's there, right? What I wanted to say is, I was driving over with snow on the ground. It was kind of like freezing rain. You know. It was nasty coming home today. You said you on your way home, you were white knuckling it on the way home. Yeah, I was slipping and sliding. Uh, once we hit 75, um, it was. We got on at the 202 coming south, and from there all the way down for about oh, 45 miles, it it was nasty. Was it nasty? Yeah. Yeah. And then they set out a, a, an alert. Uh, basically, from uh, I think Saginaw to Standish is going to be a nightmare for a little while here. Well, it was coming down, and it was not good. I can tell you that. So. And there was no fun to be had on 75. <laughs> no fun at all, hey, right? Hey, speaking of, um, guys, I, I want to say something here real quick. Um, you know, For those of you who have been following us, you like where that? is that coming from? That's coming from that, that right there. Take that audio down. Yep. Hold on. You're hearing that? No fun at all, hey, right? speaking of. Um, oh, no, actually, that's coming off my phone. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Ha-ha. It's not my fault. No. Nope, it's nope. your fault. It's my fault tonight. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, getting back to what we were talking about. Um, if you guys were following what I was doing this weekend, we had some kids up from Indiana uh, from the Backwater Legacy Camp, and 
they are on their way home right now. Everything's fine, and so if any of the parents are listening, I don't want to alarm anybody, but I did get a call from David Boggs. Um, they rolled up on a drunk driver accident, and uh, they're, they're, they weren't involved in it, right. but they witnessed it. They so witnessed it, so they're waiting for the authorities the to arrive. Yeah, so they're going to have to right. go through all that. Um, so if anybody's listening that may be from Indiana with the kids that are coming home, they may be a little late. They're safe. We talked to David. He was going to be on the show, but obviously with what's going on, he can't. So guys and gals, this time of year, if you're out there and you had a little too much to drink, make doggone sure you call and you get a designated driver, you get a taxi, something. Don't drive. I mean, right? That's, uh, there's no excuse for it. I'm sorry. So I'll get off my right. soapbox on that right now. So Phil Smith is watching. Chantel's watching. Hey, Chantel. So anyway. Anyways, let's, uh, let's. Let's get into our uh, show because you got some talking to do, buddy. Where do you want to start? Uh, well, let's start about. Well, you had to get up there, so you left Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday night we rolled out. I got out of work about nine thirty. Uh, David and his crew rolled up, uh, met me at work here in Michigan, and we rolled out of Flint at nine thirty and, and got to camp at about. 12:30 at night. <laughs> oh, they met you at, at, at work. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They All got right. there about 10 minutes before I got out. Timing was perfect. I mean, they they got there. I gotcha. Got out. My stuff was packed. I was ready to roll, and we headed north. Got to camp, like I said, about 12:30. Got everything unpacked. I think by the time we put our heads on the pillow, it was probably three, three in the morning, two, oh, three, yeah. three o'clock. Talking, gabbing. Oh yeah. oh yeah, catching up on everything. Been there, done that. So we knew. Number one, going in blind on a cold set, n not knowing what activity has been taking place at camp, um, not knowing where the deer movement is. We had fresh snow. We come up with a game plan. Dave and I are going to get up that morning, take two of the kids with us, jump in my Jeep, and then turn around and drive through the property looking and seeing where deer runs were. And okay. And fresh snow. You right, know? yep. Plus, we had to take heaters and drop them off in the blinds that we were actually going to try to get out on. So, um where we thought we might put kids. So we had to get everything kind of set up. And in the meantime, we also stopped and pulled all my cameras and pulled pulled the cards out of them, got back to camp, had lunch. And while we are having lunch, we got to open Christmas gifts, got to open up our trail cam cards uh, always, and see what we had. Always so, good to open up Christmas gifts. Yep. So that that was kind of the way we, we approached the whole hunt. Uh, like I said, going in blind. Camp has been, sh you know, basically shut down since the 28th of November. Okay. So two weeks ish. Yep. You know, they everybody pulled out right after Thanksgiving Sunday. So you know, we rolled in 10 days later, 11 days, whatever it was, and decided to get out there and try to hit it. So that's that's the way we we arrived. So you had about a couple inches of snow. There was enough snow on the ground to say it was white. It was a dusting. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, cool, at cool, that cool. point. But it was it was starting to come down a little bit. You know, over the whole weekend, we got probably three, four inches of snow. So That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Just something about hunting in snow. Yeah, it, it, uh, it enhances your senses. It enhances the experience. Um, it enhances tracking if you need to track. Right, absolutely. It helps. Yeah. It, and it also helps seeing deer. You know, you've seen a brown body move against a white background. It yep. pick up movement a lot quicker and easier. Yep, it, it definitely enhances the ability to track a deer if you have to track them. But some people don't have to. They're so good. Yeah, well, sometimes that happens. It happens. So we'll talk about yes, that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> We're going to talk about it now. We'll, we'll get there. So, so yeah, no. Uh, so, okay, so got a late start to getting some sleep, but you got up early. You got out there. Check, you pulled all the cameras. Yep. And now you're looking through them. Did you see everything on camera that uh, you were glad to see that maybe made it through the season? Or I found a new buck. Oh, a new buck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I seen him on two different cameras. So, and it, it's basically running a route that they would normally run, um, traveling from one area to another on, on a consistent basis. So. I have a feeling he was chasing, you know, looking for does, looking for a little love. And okay. I caught him on camera. Um, and that was last week when nobody was there. So um, didn't get a real good, hard look. I mean, I could see the, si the size of the body, but every time I looked, his, his antlers were turned or head was turned. I got him twice on camera. And I couldn't see if he had brow tines or not. Okay. All but right. from what I could tell, he's either a seven or a nine point. 
So he's prob- gotcha. probably a probably a two and a half, maybe a three and a half year old buck. Um, like I said, we didn't get a real good, clean, hard, definitive look at him. But from what the camera showed us, um, next year there's a possibility. But if not, definitely the next year. So right, yeah, absolutely. You know, hopefully yeah. um, he makes it to the, the the winter. Yep, absolutely. And then you can start. Hopefully he sticks around. Yeah, he doesn't need to go anywhere. Right, right. So you know, and we've seen a couple other bucks that are going to have potential. Uh, okay, you know, some smaller eights, um, uh, another six point. You know, so we're we're getting a handful of bucks now on the property on a regular basis that I've, that uh, I've seen on different cameras on different places on the property. That uh, it, it it's encouraging because you know, last year one buck was taken off the property, uh, the whole season. You know, this year no buck was taken off the property. You know, so people are being very selective at what they're they're going to pull the trigger on. Okay, going back to that, um, no bucks. Uh, did you get a total of the, like the gun season doe count? Y- yes, we were at ten going in, going into this hunt, which was okay. way right. below what we expected. Well, last year you had twenty four, right? And then this year you were selecting to go try to get thirty, right? And you were at ten. Okay, okay. So you're down. Yep. So. so and then, um, okay, so good. You got some bucks that have made it through, and it looks like uh, got some promising things for next year. Yep, absolutely. So um, other than that, you know, the usual suspect does that, uh, you know, we, we know we've got too many of. And, uh, yeah, after lunch, put a game plan together. And um, we had four kids in camp. One of the kids had never shot a buck before or shot a deer before at all. And his dad came with him, and he was, uh, his dad had never been deer hunting, period. So that was a whole new experience for him. So we had to send a guide with him. So okay. That, so that way, you know, they could help, somebody that could judge deer, understand the difference between, you know, a doe and a button buck. Yep. Um, you know, older doe versus younger doe, th- those types of things. And uh, we had uh, three, the three other kids were pretty experienced. We did put a guide with one of them early on the first day. Uh, to help him out a little bit and make sure that he understood kind of where things were at. But uh, after that, uh, yeah, they, they were rocking, man. So That's awesome to see a dad coming up that isn't into it per se. Right. But still, he's, he's coming up with them to, to sit with them. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. A, what a cool moment, you know, for both of them, actually. Well, and they actually wound up the last two sits it was just him and his son sitting out there you know okay you know they kind of got some coaching along and knew what to expect and what kind of what to look for we uh, we helped them along and their guide helped them along so um yeah it, it was a pretty cool experience you know at least i'm from my part or my view of it and watching that whole thing transpire it was pretty special that's awesome that that's so that's a good thing good father-son moment absolutely weekend. you know today when i picked him up i, I told him i said you know i said uh, you know the little, the the younger guy there that was doing the hunting. You know, I told him I said your son when he gets your age or even older and has kids of his own or grandkids. I said this is a hunt he's always going to remember and he's going to be talking about that when his dad went hunting for the first time he was with him and sitting in the blind. You know, absolutely. And they were in Michigan. You know, they're from Southern Indiana. So yeah, that that's a whole nother thing is um, coming up from from Indiana to here. Right. Right. You know? And you did do that little video when you're when you're trying out the the deer heart. We'll talk about that a little yeah, bit later. Yeah. But you asked them. That was interesting that you asked them uh, what the difference in deer was between what they see down there uh-huh. and what they saw up here. Right. And right. the differences they they he talked about quickly. Oh yeah, with the kids and stuff. The, yeah. the, the, the hunting experience it was. You know what? I just got a text, guys and gals here on the on the podcast and on the show. David Boggs just texted me. He says they're clear now. They're back on the road and they're on their way. He says he's available. So cool. Why don't we take a break? Let's let's call David on Skype and let's see if we can get him rocking in on this and uh, and talking about it. Let's do it. All right. So we're gonna step outside. We'll keep the live stream going here, folks. So bear with us. Uh, but for the podcast, we're gonna step outside. We'll be right right back after this. Okay, I'm gonna save this off here. Let me give when you get ready, I'll give you the number. Give it to me. Okay, hang on here one second. Yeah, guys and gals, if you think I'm giving David's number out live over the internet, you are mistaken. <laughs> okay, one second. Yeah. There you go. He would kill me if I did that. <laughs> but it's tempting to have everybody call him. <laughs> right. 
But yeah, you know that that whole experience with uh, with a, a young fella and and his dad, that the way that whole, whole thing transpired was, was really cool. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and bring this mic in. That brings our levels up a little bit, folks. Bear with us here. We're gonna do a little bit of adjusting. Hopefully, things sound a little better for you. Go ahead. Give him a call. Let's see if we can get him in here. Hopefully this doesn't jinx our audio. Right, right. And the phone is ringing. Hello. Hey, David's Mike. Hey, Mark. Hey, you you are live on Facebook right now. We are live streaming, so just want to so, give you a heads up so, real quick. So really, really don't tell us what you think of Mike. That's right. You're right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we go on any further, everybody's okay? Yep, everybody's okay. We just had a drunk driver that was all over the place, and she's going to kill somebody, so we had to help with some assistance getting that taken care of. Oh, I thought you said she did hit somebody. No, said she almost did, dude. She almost drove her, her Porsche up under a semi and caused at least five other accidents, but she couldn't keep it between the yellow and the white line. Wow. wow. It went off all over the place. It was pretty bad, and then it was in the middle of a shift change, and it was just a, a hassle to get somebody to get her butt pulled over. Okay, yeah. we I kind of ran through oh. that just in case any of the parents were listening. I said, everybody's okay, you know. So. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not involved. Yeah, so so any of the parents that are still listening, that, that may be listening if their kids are on the road there coming home to Indiana, uh, David's got got them all, and they're all safe. So. Yep. All right, so let's go. Let's get into the second segment, David. We just basically talked about how we scouted and got into the first part of the hunt, so that's where we're at. Okay. okay. All right, here we go. Stand by in three, two, and one. Welcome back, everybody. We are back live here on the live stream and the podcast, and we have made connection with the David Boggs. David, how you doing, brother? I'm uh, doing great, brother. Doing great. So, uh, how's the weather traveling south? Is it getting any better? It's getting better as we get closer to home. We're about three hours out from home now, but it was Michigan treating me the way it normally does when I leave, and spits and ice and snow and everything else all over us and makes it nice and fun for the first three hours and then it gets easy on me after we're stressed out but okay. we're good we're rolling it's looking looking clear right now okay gotcha gotcha good yeah. hopefully uh, the rest of the way will be good for you uh, but you know we had you and had your bunch up here for for this doe management hunt um you know and we've been talking a little bit about how we set everything up and got rocking here with it and uh you know basically getting into the first uh, the, the first real hunt, getting people out, getting them into the stands and everything, and uh, explained how, you know, when we set, uh, we set the hunter up that had, uh, had never shot a deer before, and, you know, he had his dad with him, but we also put a guide with him that first day out in the field. Um, and actually, unfortunately, we, we put him in what we thought was the best stand, and they never saw anything that evening. So That shocks me in that field. I know. You know what field I know what field. Yeah, I know what field. It's, uh, it bl kind of blew my mind, blew David's mind. So, uh, you know, but after that first evening, I'm trying to remember, uh, I think I seen seven deer that evening, that first evening, and I get in the stand, and it's about, oh, two o'clock in the afternoon. At 2.30, my dad calls. So I'm like, okay, my dad doesn't call at 2.30 on a, on a Friday afternoon unless something's wrong. So I answer the phone. I'm like, hey, what's up, pops? Oh, I'll just call and see what you're doing. Are you at work? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm in the deer stand. And he's like, oh, I thought you were at work, you know. So we're, we talked for a minute. And I go, oh, hey, wait, wait, wait. I go, Hang on, just a minute. And he goes, what's the matter? I go, I got deer in front of me. So I put the phone down. And I was hoping I was going to get to shoot one. Oh, that would have been classic. on the phone, but they they got away from me. I mean, it was just bang, bang, and they were gone. So, But uh, David, uh, I'm trying to remember where you wound up on the first the first day. Didn't didn't you get out and just do a little, little sightseeing? Am I right or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I went out and did a little sightseeing. I went behind the little cabin there. Uh, That's right. On the back trails. Yeah, but I had to, I was only, I only had about a two-hour hunt because I we forgot to buy a hamburger for our chili, and we were having chili that night. So we, I had to make a run into town, so I lost that time. We? You got a mouse no, in your pocket? Okay, I, had I forgot. <laughs> okay, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> so he had a great time. I did time. not buy the hamburger. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, but everybody saw saw a game that night, and actually two of, of the hunters had opportunities to kill deer that night, and they chose Correct. not to. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I think uh, I've got Cole finally psyched up. I'm going to pass the phone to Cole let Cole talk about his experience. Okay, all right. I'll pick back up with you when you're ready. Okay. Here you go, Cole. Hello. Hey, Cole, what's going on, man? Oh, not a whole lot much. Okay, um, you, you're live. Home. You're live on Facebook, so I just want to warn you. Oh boy. Okay, everybody, oh boy. Out, everybody out there can can hear you, and uh, and I'm also recording this, so <laughs> no lies. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're just talking about your first hunt. You know, you were out in the stand, and you had an opportunity to shoot that night, but you you chose not to. Kind of run us through why you chose not to. Yeah, um, it, it was the first night um, that I was going to be out there. I figured, you know, I'd see quite a bit more, which I did. Um, and she had a uh, she had a little uh, farm with her that, that was just born this past spring. So um, I figured I, I'd give her the best chance I could. And uh, um, if she would have probably gave me a second look after she got behind some trees, um, I probably would have took the shot. But, uh, you know, it was first night. I'd already seen three that night. Um, I figured I'd see a lot more, which I did. So uh, I, I still feel like I made the right choice. Um, I just couldn't get a shot off at any of the other ones. Okay, right on. And, and the reason yep. I, I, and I, I'm not trying to bust your chops on this, because actually we had somebody email us uh, this evening about that same question and wanted to know why they should, you know, because we've talked about this, and we talked about it at camp. You know, I told you, go ahead and shoot those. And uh, the, yeah. the guy who emailed us, he said, hey, I've been listening to you guys talk about this stuff. He said, convince me why I should shoot a doe that's got a little one. And, and I kind of wanted to run through, you know, those scenarios uh, with you and uh, with Marquise, who, who kind of was the same thing. He had one okay. that had a little one and, and chose not to shoot. So, um, and that's why I just wanted to hear it right straight from the horse's mouth, you know, of what was playing through your mind. Right, exactly. And, and, that, you and know, what you were thinking. So, And our listener that, that emailed us, it, he, he kept letting the does go by because he's always thinking there's a buck behind and there's a buck behind. Right. And he, he just could never pull it. So, yeah, he wants us to convince him to shoot a doe. Right. So, um, but you had, uh, you had also had another u very unique experience. Um, you had a critter come in uh, pretty close to your stand, I understand, right? And yeah, came, that's right. It um, came, came in through the air. Yeah. <clears throat> Run through uh, that I was, was sitting there in the stand, and um, I looked up, and I actually seen a bald eagle uh, flying around in the air, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. Uh, I had a video camera with me. Um, I didn't think I'd ever get a good enough shot with it flying in the air as high as it was. So I turned around and started looking for some more deer, and uh, I turned back to my left, and next thing I know, I see wings stretched out about mm, probably 10 yards from my stand, and uh, she's sitting up there in a the birch tree. Um, <laughs> wow. She flew right in and sat down beside me. But I tried to get the video camera to get at least a picture on her, and I couldn't do it. She seen me and took off. So really neat experience, though. Is it, I, I got to assume that's probably the closest you've ever had a bald eagle to you. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, they they are big. <laughs> yeah, that's what you were saying. Their the wingspans is as wide as you are tall, and you're a tall boy. Oh yeah. So, that was awesome. Um, so while I got you on here, uh, you hunt in southern Indiana. Okay, you're down from around Bloomington area. Is that right? Are you? Oh uh, yeah, just south of there. Okay. So. Now, with your experience in hunting down that way, uh, you, you're 18, you, 18 or 19. How old are you? 18. 18, okay. You're in first year of college, but you've hunted a lot down that way. Uh, I've, I've gathered from right. what you've told me that you've spent a lot of time afield. What did you notice was the biggest difference uh, between hunting in southern Indiana and up here in Michigan besides the snow? I mean, but, but what, what kind of <laughs> – what, what – uh, what was going through your mind? Like, wow, I never would have thought of that. Or, man, that's different. You know, what are some of those things? I had actually looked at some of your guys' deer stands um, and just seeing how the deer behaved around them. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't seem they didn't seem to mind the deer stands nearly as much as what they do back home. Okay. Um, if they see a deer stand, they tend to go on the other side of the field from it. They don't like to go anywhere near them things because they know what's going on near them. Okay. Um, I, the deer deer back home they know that we're there and they know that uh they know when we're there and what we're doing so up here i just feel like that uh, that they don't necessarily know why we're there and they're more or less curious about why we're there so, okay um 
they just pretend deer stand ain't even there. Okay. It, was there anything about like maybe the size of the deer? Uh, uh, you know, a doe up here versus a doe down there. You know, your typical, you know, nanny right. doe. It seemed like it seemed uh, seemed like your guys' does up here were, I want to say, a little bit longer than ours, but they weren't quite as thick um, as far as height wise in the body. Okay. But uh, overall, though, I think your guys' were about the same size as ours. Okay. Uh, their he- their heads just seem to be a lot bigger than ours, though. Okay. I don't know why that is, but. All right. Yeah, I, I just, you know, you get into different parts of the country. Oh, and, you know, the same animal looks look, you know different. Well, for whatever reason, you talk about a deer in Saskatchewan as opposed to deer in Texas, right? Right, right on. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, and we're somewhere in between, and they have to manage the elements differently. Right. Okay. Now, I've warned all of y'all coming up here. Pack warm clothes. Pack warm boots. Did you get cold? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I did, and I even had some over boots with me. Um, I have on actually my hunting boots right now. They're 800 gram uh, thin slate, and I mean, I still got cold out there. It it is definitely cold up here in Michigan. Okay, when you're out, when you're hunting Southern Indiana, you know, let's say late season, what's the average temperature? Oh shoot, it's probably 35 somewhere in there. I mean, it 35. Okay, that's a good that's, number. That, that's pretty balmy. <laughs> yeah, it is for that that's, that time of year, I mean, especially for up here. I mean, yeah. we're in the twenties. Well, we went out a couple more, a couple of those mornings. You guys went out. Um, I didn't go out and hunt the mornings, but uh, it was it was like twenty degrees, yeah, maybe it, in the teens. At a couple, you know, one morning it was in the teens. So, yeah, yeah. you know, nothing like being in the deer stand when it's zero, right? Right on, you know. But uh, so that was a little bit of a shock to the cold, huh? Um, I, I thought I was prepared for it, but, um, yeah, I, I feel like I could have survived out there, but for deer hunting, it made it, made it real cold. Yeah, okay. Um, Dan, ask him a little bit about what the number one animal in Michigan that he's afraid of is. Oh, he has a, he has a, he, he has oh, an boy. animal that he's afraid of in Mich- from Michigan? Well, he didn't really come out right. Well, he did admit it. Yeah, he did admit it to us. He was a little skittish. Let me tell you, let me, let me, let me guess. Is he, is he skittish of a, of a mouse? I don't know. What what is it, Cole? Oh, um, I'm I'm not a big fan of bears up there. <laughs> bears? Oh, <laughs> oh, well, we're afraid a little the uh, Winnie the Pooh's gonna come out and get you. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> you know, and that's you know that's something I really don't even think about when we're up there hunting. It's it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, if you see one, it's like, oh, cool, there's a bear, and. I forget when when you bring people that don't normally hunt northern Michigan and, and don't experience that. But but now I will say he's hunted out west. Cole, you've hunted out west, right? So, right. So you you you've had uh, you know you've hunted in areas before with bear, but but typically when we bring people up here, they don't have that experience. Usually usually in Michigan, by the time we get into December, we're, we're pretty good. Yeah. My worrisome is always in the September October if it's a warm November. Yeah, time frame. Right. But so so what were you thinking there, Cole, when you were walking out? Did you think he was gonna start to follow you and find you? No, not necessarily that. I just didn't want to walk up on one. Um I I just not a big fan of surprising animals like that. Uh <laughs> you know, but bears a three hundred and fifty pound black bear don't seem too uh, appealing to me while I'm walking up on it in the dark. <laughs> no, no, not really. And they can move pretty fast through the woods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, all in all, what do you think about hunting northern Michigan? I mean, what, what was your overall experience like? Oh, it was amazing. Um, if I ever had the chance, I'd come right back in a heartbeat. Right. Um, it was real, really good hunting. Got to see a lot of deer, a lot of different animals, and very cool experiences. Okay. Now, we, we did get <laughs> snow on the ground. We hunted in the snow. Have, have you ever, and I know you've hunted out west before and stuff. You, I imagine you've, you've experienced that before, hunting in the snow? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, been elk hunting in the uh, late December and don't walking through knee high snow. Okay, okay. Um, so you, you you know what that game's all about then. Yeah. All right. Well, is uh, is David eat all the the beef jerky or I mean all the deer jerky that he stopped and bought on the way home? Or is he still chewing on? No, it? he's well. I don't know if he still has his or not, but I know mine's kept right beside me. He ain't getting to it. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Well, you guys have a safe trip. Let me holler back at David. You take care now. All right. All right, thank you. Yep. Have a safe. Bye. Yep. I bet he's eat all of it. We'll see. I probably. 
All right, I'm back. I, I assume that you're riding me like a saddle, huh? Uh, well, we're trying to figure out if you've eaten all that, that jerky that you bought on the way back yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a tradition. I hate to break traditions. You know that. All right, all right. Well, okay, fair enough. But now i got five other people addicted to it. Okay, that's good. So <laughs> next time they're in Michigan, they're going to stop at the jerky outlet and make sure they pile up with some. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of got the rundown with Cole, kind of what he thought about the whole thing uh, and, and his experience of, of what he went through. Uh, we did have one kid that actually took a shot um, and didn't draw blood. So you were nearby. You were, you were hanging out doing a little bit of uh, investigating when that whole scenario went down. So you want to run through that real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, Bailey's one of our young cadets. He's 15 years old. We'd had him hunting out with some adults, and we've had him out with some of the older kids. So this was his first time out. I sent him and Cole out together, and then I backtracked them uh, about 40 minutes after I sent them out. And I like to do that. I can do that with my adult clients sometimes. I'll go up, I'll send them out, and then I can observe them from a distance and see what's going on, you know. Right. See, if, see in here if they're making too much noise in their stand. Uh, in Bailey's case, I was able I could track and knew his footprint. And I could tell by your sandy soil and the way his foot's hit. And I'm like, dude, you were making a ton of noise on your way in. That's why you didn't see nothing on the way in. Uh, but, yeah, I, I tracked him back to the, to the blind he was in. Uh, I stayed downwind from him. I got to a position, and I sat there and watched and observed him through the binoculars. And ended up, I decided to lay down on the ground because you never know which way they're going to shoot, and that's the safest position. And I'm watching him, watching him. I lay there for about two hours, about nine 9.50. I say, okay. I text him, and he, he still doesn't know that I'm there. I say, are you ready to go? And he says, okay, yeah, I'll start getting ready. Well, it's not three minutes later. I hear a bunch of thundering and crashing about 30 yards behind me, and I roll over on my side and look, and I've got two giant does running right at me, which actually hurtled me and jumped over me. That was a new experience for me. I just curled up in the fetal position, and they went right over top of me. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do, and I was very proud of, proud of him, buddy. He, uh, they ran past me, went 50 yards to the blind, and then made a hook and went right in front of the blind. And we're, all, you know, we're talking three seconds. He had three seconds to identi see it, identify it, brace up, and take the shot. And he did. And I think he went high. I think he just barely missed. But I was impressed. I don't even know if I could have got a shot off that quick when I'm packing up. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's deer, and they're running at full blast. And then he, he said he grunted at him. I couldn't hear him. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> he said he did grunt and got one of them to stop, and I could see one of them, and then it did stop. Uh, the other one I couldn't see, which was apparently the other one's the one he shot at. Okay. Uh, from my position, I had a little hill in front of me, and I couldn't see it. But, yeah, he squeezed off the shot. He said he braced it up, which is what we try to teach all of our kids to do. And even in a, a surprise situation, find something to brace off, do good, better, best. You know, find, the, find a good spot, find the better spot, get the best spot, do whatever you can for the best situation. Brace up. Never take that freehand shot. And uh, he felt very confident. He hit it. But unfortunately, uh, the results didn't show that. Yeah, you, you guys actually went out uh, and couldn't. And there's snow on the ground. So immediately. Now, what did he say when you walked up that quick? Because he didn't know you were that you were you were behind him. <laughs> he said, you're Holly. I about <laughs> smoked you. You scared me to death. <laughs> He had no idea I was there. Uh -huh. And then he said, but I smoked her, man. I got her. I got her. I said, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, well, since I'm here and I saw it, we'll look we'll, we'll look at the last set of tracks. We won't go in deep, but I want to see if you got blood or not. I want to see what I could. Right. And we couldn't find any blood. Uh, we tried uh, uh, later on that evening. We tried, tried to find her again and uh, took Cole out there with us, made a big circle. And we did everything within our power pretty much. Uh, you and I were going to go out this morning, but due to time constraints, we didn't. But we put in a good effort to find her. But I had no indication whatsoever that he hit her. Okay. So we decided that uh, we would uh, just call it quits there. And then uh, that evening, we went on a coyote hunt, which was unproductive. Uh, got in about 1, I guess it was 1 o'clock. And then today, the boys went out and do some coyote stuff again and some deer hunting. But it just didn't happen these last couple of days, but we still had a great time. Right, right, yep. So that was uh, that was pretty much the the deal. Um, I was talking that about was uh, yeah. I was talking to him uh, to Danny about uh, the young fellow who uh, who didn't have uh, opportunity to shoot one the first day, the first evening hunt, and the first morning hunt. So we moved him over to my blind. 
Um, I tell you what, let's step outside. We take our second break. We come back. I want to run through that whole scenario on how we set them up, and you can talk about that as well because you, you know a lot about that situation. So we're going to step outside. We'll be right back after this, folks. For those of you on live stream, hang tight real quick. We'll uh, save this off, and we'll keep rocking. How's the roads now? Still still uh, making the trail yeah. south? No. Yeah, it's a little, yep, making the trail south. We're actually pulling into a gas station right now. It's wet and foggy, but it's clear, easy traveling. I can't see what the temperature is, but, yeah, it's getting better further south we get. Good, 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 good. Uh, what what all do we want to cover on Gabe here? Uh, I'll just kind of lead you through it. You know, we'll we'll make our way through it. Okay. Um, you all know, right. you chime in as, as you see fit, and we'll, we'll – uh, just kind of finish out the story. So, um, all right, here we go. Stand by three, two, and one. Welcome back. Third segment of the show. We've now gotten into our second day of the hunt. Now, when when the boys went out, uh, no, they went out coyote hunting. That was last night. I take that back. When we came in, when we came in from that first evening hunt, I didn't sleep hardly at all. We got up there late. David and I got up early that morning, went out and scouted, pre-scouted everything, got everything together, made our uh, decisions on what we're going to do with, with the kid, put the kids and all that. Then I went out and hunted while David went and got hamburger. <laughs> 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 so uh, we got back into camp. We eat supper that night, kicked back, started talking. Next thing I know, it's, I don't know, what was it, 1 o'clock in the morning again? It was pretty, yeah. it was pretty late. And... I, it took a toll on me. I couldn't sleep. I was so tired I couldn't sleep. And when I finally got to sleep, I hear a knock on the door at 5 a.m. Hey, it's 5 o'clock, Mike. You getting up? And that's David knocking on the door. And I'm like, <laughs> and I said, what time is it? He said, 5. And I said, what's the temperature? And I think he said, was it 15? You told me it's 15 degrees? Yeah. I said, I 12 at that time. 12. <laughs> I said, well, I said, I've slept about two hours. I said, I ain't going out. <laughs> I rolled back <laughs> over. And I think I woke up. It was about 9 o'clock. But, uh, but everybody else went out that morning. Did you, did you go out that morning, Dave, and, and hunt? Was that the morning that Gabe shot? That was the morning, wasn't it, that he shot? I do believe. Uh, they all run together, man. Gabe did Not Gabe. I'm sorry. Yeah, not I Gabe. Uh, Bailey. Went, yeah. That was the morning that, he no, shot. Saturday was, yeah, Marquis. Yeah, they all ran in on me, too, especially, you know, last one to bed and first one up. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So uh, Gabe, Gabe and his family, they're they're kind of, you know, he brought his father along with him. Yeah. And his father is not a hunter. This is his first experience with hunting. Neither one of them had any experience. So, uh, you know, uh, who was it went out with them? I think did Tony go out with them the first no, day? Dave, no, Dave White went Dave out with White. them. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Dave White went out with them the first day, trying to you know teach them the sex and the, and 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 age deer, and you know that's one of the hardest things out there. And I think we might have. I went a little too far on that, and that's why they didn't take some of those shots right. that we would have took. <laughs> right. Well, and that was the thing is they weren't seeing deer, so I, I made the decision. I mean, I'm feeling bad. You know, I mean, we brought these kids up here to have fun and see deer and, and have right. opportunity. So I'm like, I said, I saw deer in my stand. I, I have a good indication that you're going to see deer up here. You not might see a lot, but you're going to see deer. I said, we're going to my stand. So I, that was Saturday evening that we, yeah, Saturday evening. We went and put them in my stand. Oh, okay. So... Um, made our way out there. I got them all set up. And as we're walking up to my stand, I look about 200 yards down down in front of me. And all of a sudden, bang, here comes five, four four deer. I, was, I see I see bodies and flags. And I, I mean, it was far away. Got a and I'm like, hey, deer, 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 right there, you know. And they look up, and I said, well, we don't see them. I said, they just busted right through there. I said, let's get in the stand. So I got them all set up. Give them the indications of where deer are going to be coming through, where they need to set up, where to look where their shot, uh, shooting lanes were and all that, and, and give them distances of where they'd feel comfortable, knowing if it passed in front of, you know, that big tree right there, that, you know, that's 100 yards and in. Right. You know, so we, we kind of run through all those scenarios. And uh, I said, okay, now I'm, I'm going to go on down the hill here, and I said, I'm going to get down in a, in a spot where there's no possible way you can, you can shoot me. Okay, I said, I'm down. I said, I'm, I'm going to be 15 to 20 feet down below in a hole. That uh, if you even if you were to shoot, it's going to go way over my head. Right. So I went up and set up on a deer run. You know, um, one that fe that runs right down into my food plot. And this was I dropped him off at two o'clock. So I go down to my spot, sit down, kind of hang out, and all of a sudden, I, you know me, 
social bug that yeah, I Yeah, you are. I'm taking taking a couple photos, putting them on Facebook, doing my thing, and you know, and all of a sudden it started snowing to beat the band. It, I mean, it was a blow coming in. Visibility's dropping, and I'm looking, and I'm getting snow piling up on my shoulders, and I'm like, "This is cool." But this ain't good, for, you know. I mean, it's good deer hunting, but I I need to be on the move. I need to get up and, and just walk a little bit. I was gonna go push down the swamp, thinking the deer are gonna be in the swamp holding up during this, this blow, and the wind's blowing pretty hard at that time. So, I uh, I start to get up, make my way down. I moved on down oh probably 40, 50 yards at the most, and it took me a while to get there. I'm just slow, you know, slow stalking, and I lean against a tree, and I'm looking down across my food plot. And I hear this this squirrel just going to town behind me, you know, way up on the hill on the ridge. Yep. And I'm like, well, it's blowing and it's snowing. Why is a squirrel barking and raising cane? I said, it's got to be a coyote or, or deer. So I'm leaning against the tree, and I'm like, I'm just not going to step out and walk around. So I just rolled, rolled around the tree to put the tree between me and the squirrel. And then I peeked my head out around the tree, and there's a big old doe standing up on the ridge, staring straight at me. <laughs> you know, it looks like Mickey Mouse, big old floppy ears. So I'm like, okay, game on, girl. And I didn't move. She didn't move. I didn't. It was a stalemate for about three or four minutes, you know. And then she flicked her tail, put her head down to walk. I clicked the safety off. She walked behind the tree. Gun comes up immediately, and I'm braced up against the tree. And as soon as she stepped out, boom, down she goes. I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> I got a deer down, you know, and that's the first deer of the season, you know. Right. It's been a long season, so I mean, I'm I'm all giddy about that, and so I'm thinking to myself, I said, man, I better go ahead and reload. You know, you never know. I got three tags. Right. Let's get ready. So, I grab all my gear, reload real quick, and I take and I look up as I'm putting my ramrod back down in in my my gun, and there's another doe standing there. Not as big, but it was, it was doe. And I said, hmm. <laughs> and watching it, she's watching me. And she starts, she flicks her tail a little bit, and she starts to walk. And she, but she's going to walk down to where I just dropped the, the the dad and the boy off. And I said, okay, that's a little hike down there. But I said, maybe she'll go down that way, and he'll get a shot. Right. And, you know, so I'm watching a little bit, and she kind of starts to walk off. So I lean the gun against the tree, bend down, zip my backpack up. When I stand back up and look, she circled and came back. I don't know if it was curiosity oh, or, probably. or what, you know. And she's standing there, she's quartering two. And by this time, it was snowing so hard. In that short amount of time, my scope, because the gun's pointing oh, yeah, against okay. the tree, the scope was starting to fill with snow, and it was fogged over. I pulled the gun up, and I'm free-handed at this point. No bracing, because I had to reach to get the gun off the tree. Put it up, look at her through the scope. I can see her, put the crosshairs on her, I'm looking, looking, looking. I'm like, come on, take another step or two, but turn sideways. And as soon as she took that step and opened that front shoulder up, wham! She she starts shoveling. You know how the deer yep. can knock their front legs out, and she just starts plowing. And she runs about 20, 30 yards and drops. She dropped within two to three feet of the other deer I shot. <laughs> <laughs> and you took a picture of it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I'm there for like two minutes. I dropped two deer with a muzzle loader. Not bad deal. The Alcona sniper. There you go. <laughs> well, because you're using that bump stock on the muzzle loader. Yeah, okay. He's accusing me of using a bump stock. All right. Going to go there. I see how you are. Right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Dave, you, you were were you out in the field when, when those shots went off? Yeah. Yeah, I thought I said a little past myself, Danny. See? I, see? He's using that bump <laughs> stock on the muzzle loader. You know. Yeah, no, I, I heard you, but uh, it wasn't where I thought you were. Okay. Uh, I did the way it, it echoed down that canyon. I thought that was the neighbor. Okay. So, so I, yeah, and then uh, you sent me a text shortly thereafter that uh, well, somebody had luck, and we we traded a couple of paragraphs. I said, yeah, it's the neighbors. He said, no, it's me. <laughs> Two does down, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Two down. I said, you doubled up. Like, yeah. That not- was a big surprise because you just weren't where I thought you were. And, and that, that's outstanding, Mike. I'm, I'm very impressed and congratulations. Oh, uh, I tell you what, I it, when that second one dropped, I was just like, I started giggling. I mean, I don't know why, but the emotion, it was just, I giggled like a little schoolgirl. Right? Just, it, it's a hunt that was so simplistic, but yet still it had so much wrapped up into it. And it just, man, it happened that quick. You know, I mean, you, a whole season can change in, in a matter of seconds. Right, exactly. You exactly. can, you know. Absolutely. Let, 
you know, like you said before, gun season, you were kind of checking yourself and thinking mm -hmm. about things, and, and all of a sudden here come muzzleloader season, 10 yeah. days later. Yep. You got two down in, in two minutes. Yeah, game on. You know, had a fistful of tags, and it was time to, to make some dinner, you know. Right. Put them on the grill. You know, the only thing is I wish, I wish that doe really would have kept walking and went down to the to the other guy, the the younger guy down there. This, he could have shot his first deer with his dad sitting there because that would have made my day. That had been, that had been made my day more than the doe that I shot. Right. I totally agree so, there. But, uh, yeah, and, and the other thing was they were like, Maybe 20 feet from, from the road. So, dragon was easy. <laughs> you got to like that. It, I did. I did like that. It was good, you know. It was, uh, but uh, I tell you, Gabe did say, he said, man, I jumped. <laughs> yeah, you will jump. Yeah, I agreed there. But here's a good thought going through my mind. I said, I know they heard it. I said, they're going to think, yeah, Mike shot, put a bad shot on one, and had to reload and take another shot. I know that's what they're thinking. And when we, we went down, he's like, you got two? <laughs> Was right? <laughs> so that was pretty good. But, uh, and then uh, the other gentleman that was sitting with Gabe and his dad, the first two hunts, he was out. Uh, we, we put him up on, on a, a uh, out in the open, old school, like I was hunting it. Okay. I went out old school, sitting on the ground, you know, doing a little deep wood stalking. And I, he did the same thing. We had him in another spot, and he shot a doe. So we had three doe down that evening, you know, within a you know, matter of an hour, hour and a half. So it worked out really well. So long story short, I, I continued down, got down to my field, and uh, got in there. And I was going to warm up, and that's when I called you. Yeah, okay, that's when you called me. Yeah, and then my dad called, and he said, uh, he called me, and he says, hey, what's going on? I said, oh, I said, just sitting here watching it snow, sitting here in the blind. He goes, oh, just watching it snow along with the deer. I go, well, there's two deer that are no longer going to see a snowfall. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you shot two? And I said, yeah, I shot two. So that was pretty cool. But uh, after that, um, we got back to camp. Everybody came in. And uh, actually, I went back early and waited for everybody to come back in so I wouldn't screw up everybody else's hunt. Right. Got the trailer. We went and started picking deer up. And uh, David, I knew David was going to go coyote hunting that night. And I said, hey, I said, you want some gut piles? Right, and perfect, perfect bait. Yeah, so we said, yeah. So at that point in time, we said, okay, let's get all the deer together, and we'll, we'll get set up a coyote bait uh, pile and let them hunt over that. So, and that's what we did. But we, we did a little something different with that. Um, let's take our last break, Dave. When I come back, I want you to explain. We kind of opened up a little schooling on these kids at that point in time, but I'll, I want you to explain that when we come back. We're going to step outside and we'll be right. right back after this. Okay, let me save this one off here, folks. Tim Sias joined us. Thanks, Ken. He's congratulating both of us on a very successful year. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. All right. Here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. Welcome back. Last segment of the show. This might run a little bit long, folks. Just going to warn you. Right. Because <laughs> we still got some stuff to talk about. So David wanted to go coyote hunting. But when we got up there to where we are going to coyote hunt, we decided to do something a little different. I talked with David, and David had an idea. I had an idea. We kind of put some things together. David, go ahead and tell him what we did. All right. Well, we always take advantage of every opportunity we can you know to give a little education three of the boys had had some limited experience still dressing some deer uh, obviously one kid did not gave so we decided to take the advantage of that and skin them out and get those gut piles and we know anytime you're skinning you know when you're taking the guts out of an animal for the first time that's one of the highlights it, it, us, us guys have done it many times is guiding them through that and and letting them feel and see and and get the smells and hopefully not get the smells of, <laughs> of when they <laughs> they make a bad cut and it's a learning experience for them we had dave white one of our newest instructors uh give us a, a fine schooling on how to do it do it quickly and and do it safely and then we started to have the kids do it and of course our youngest most inexperienced is the most eager one you know to dive in there and get it done and uh, uh gabe did it we coached him through it uh actually taught him a couple of different ways uh, Marquise also stepped in, got his hands nice and bloody and dirty, and you know we just went through it all and went through the the different organs and what we're looking for and diseases and parasites. Uh, 
stuff like that. And, and then we had a little fun with the heart, which we ended up eating later. If you saw the live cast that evening, we, we all enjoyed some heart, even yourself. Yes. Uh, yep. You know, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a great time. There's some of the stuff we can't say, and there may be some clips later after it's edited right. of, of that adventure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, as, as adult men standing back watching younger men, you know, and that's what they are. These are young men you know, learn and work their way through these hunting experiences and learning to do things. Yeah, we, we say and do a few things that, that might not, you know. Video worthy? Some people might frown on it. Right. But, you know, it, it's all, and if you guys are out there that, are, that have been hunting, it, you know exactly what we're talking about. But that's hunting, man. That's that's what makes hunting camaraderie so great. Absolutely. Is sharing those those men moments, you know, with each other, um, watching these young men grow up to be hunters and men themselves and, and take these first-time experiences. Um, it was simply incredible. And I was standing there watching, and there was a technique that was used that I had never seen before that I learned something. And it was, you know, when, when I'm gutting a doe um, or a buck that I'm not going to mount, I always, you know, when we cut up, I get to the breastbone, I go up one side. Right. You know, split that them ribs open up, uh, you know, all the way through, so you can open it up and get up in there and pull out, you know, the esophagus, the heart, the the lungs, cut the diaphragm, pull that all out. But what David White showed me, and show, and I was blown away. He's like, okay, yeah, cut up that side now, cut up the other side, and of the sternum, and did the same thing. So he's got two cuts, and then he pulled that sternum and he pulled it up straight up, and then cut it. So now you've got a channel. Yeah, it's wide open. It's wide open. It makes it so much easier to, to get in there and get a hold of the esophagus, cut it, and bring all that out. I was blown away, so I learned that's something. All, you know? That's the best technique, too, also. If you if you think by chance you've got a broadhead lodged someplace in there, that's that's the best. You know, we talk good, better, best. That's the best technique if you, if you think there's a possibility of a broadhead stuck in there because you've got so much more room you can see. You've got more room to work. The, the organs it gives them more room to slide down so it's just told a little better and i highly recommend that people look that up you know and the other thing that that not only just that but the fact that that one uh that smaller deer that second deer i actually clipped the front shoulder on and, and broke that deer down quick but that whole front shoulder assembly was was shattered yep and dave's like he reached up in there david white he's like well wait you know before you just jam your hand and he said there's there's some sharp fragments in here and by the way he opened that chest cavity up it allowed him to pull open further and, and it really expose it and be and able to it. see it and keep his hands away from those sharp uh bone bone right. ends and puncturing his hand and then getting you know because you don't know what to do if a deer does have something and you cut yourself you got a chance of that getting into your blood yep exactly so um, you know, even just for that technique of that, you know, of, of a shoulder shot and then blowing that shoulder apart, or like Dave said, you know, it could be a broadhead. So, you know, there's multiple reasons right there, two reasons that I see that, that that's a way to do it. Right. So, so th David, uh, tell, tell Dave White, thank you for, for teaching me something, you know, because uh, Absolutely. it was awesome, you know. But then yeah. we get, we get back to – oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, I just want to say – I really appreciate Dave, and he's a, he's a new asset to our organization, and, uh, you know, we're happy to have him. I want to give him the public credit that he deserves, but we're always, every day, and you're the same way, you know, we're always trying to learn something from each other right. and discuss things and make it better, and I, I really appreciate him, and I welcome him to the team. Absolutely. Um, a great asset. Like I said, I learned a lot, you know, and, you know, him and I, you know, this guy's hunted around uh, different places around the country, but he hadn't hunted Michigan. So we're sharing different experiences and, and learning different things from each other, you know. And if you've got an open mind about hunting, and you, and don't stick your nose up and think you know it all. Absolutely not. You know, I don't care who you are. There's something out there you don't know. And we, we've talked about that before. You can we, learn something. We can always learn something. So um, I appreciate that. But, yeah, we went back. Speaking of learning something. They pulled the hearts out. They go, yeah, we're going to take these back to camp and cook them. And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. You guys can have them. Like, what, you don't eat it? I'm like, no, never have. Don't want it. So get back to camp. And David White starts playing Chef Boyardee on these hearts. And I'm watching him cutting them. And it's like, that's not the way I've seen it prepared typically. And I'm watching what he's doing. And all of a sudden, he he uh, he has a, it was butter and garlic, wasn't it? Or was just butter? What did he use? Just butter. Just butter. He just butter and then uh, unsalted butter, and then uh, topped it off with salt and pepper at the end. And 
He cut them real thin. I mean, extremely thin. Yeah, because it only took two minutes he, aside. Yeah. And put them in the pan, and, you know, the, the butter's nice nice and hot, not scalded, but, you know, not burning, but, but it's nice and hot to cook and sear that meat. And two minutes on each side, me, you know, is medium, medium rare. And the smell didn't bother me. I'm like, that was the biggest problem before is the way it was cooked. I couldn't take the smell. Okay. And, and it's a psychological thing as well. Absolutely. You know, all you're going to eat is the heart, but it's a muscle. So yeah. I'm like, you've seen the I Facebook actually, Live. I, I tried a piece. It was awesome. What's yeah, it? I actually learned learned from that also. Okay. I've, had, I've seen it and had it done a few times and, and didn't care much for it. I thought it was okay, but not something a highlight, you know, no back strap. Right. Uh, but Dave's is pretty darn close to it. Yeah. But it was the, the technique that he cut it, I'd never even seen before. And it resulted in a, a much more tender tender heart, uh, in my opinion. I mean, I, I, was, I was impressed, too. I learned something from that. He, he kind of cut it like he would a bell pepper. And, and that really worked out. It had a better result than some of the other... Uh, times that i've tried it and it tastes and, and chewed like a rubber band right absolutely but yeah. the days was outstanding i was very impressed when they say melt in your mouth it, it literally did it really it, it i was just i was expecting the worst you know yeah, okay guys i'm on facebook live i'm gonna i'm for you guys i'm gonna try to your heart you know <laughs> and i'm like whoa Man, that that's good. David, cut me another piece of that, please. <laughs> you really? know, it, I was shocked. That's awesome. I was. It, it tasted like venison. You know, it's yeah. just like six six out of nine people tried it for the first time, and every one of them loved it. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of people there that never tried it before. I guess I'm gonna have to try it. So it. Uh, well, when you come back up to camp and we're all there together. I could be the guinea pig. You'll yep. try first. No, no, you you'll be able to the one to receive and, and sit down and, and enjoy it because I'm telling you what, man, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It good. It, it was uh, it was nothing like I imagined. That's awesome. So, yeah, I I got to try that for the first time. It was incredible. So, but uh, the kids went out hunting again this morning. Dave and I ran around, uh, grabbed closed up blinds and stuff, and grabbed our gear, cleaned camp up, and loaded deer up and, and made our way home but uh, we had one more highlight on the way the way out as uh, as we came home the dnr check station was open <laughs> you've heard me talk how many times that i've tried right so the one on the highway no it was the the main one there in mayo on 33 oh okay main right, yeah, yeah okay yeah, so right. we pull in the open signs open and i'm like okay i hope somebody just didn't forget to turn the sign yeah exactly pull in and doors rolled up they got all the gear there but no you know there's nobody lined up and we pull up and the uh, older gentleman comes out you know doing our employee and you know tried a little bit of small talk at first and he was okay he was nice enough but then when we i told david i said get the kids out i said we're about to have class again and uh, we got those kids out, and that the the DNR official all of a sudden he just kind of lit up, and we had school. Right, he held school right there. Those kids learned how to age deer, learn why we take the heads in, learn what they were looking for, and how they find that stuff. And uh, they had they had another educational lesson right there. So it was awesome. Not only a weekend of hunting, but a weekend of education. Yeah. So you know that's the way Backwaters does it, right, David? That's right. We're the best in outdoor education. So. Uh, speaking of, we've talked a little bit about Backwaters. For those of you who are on the live stream or those on the podcast that don't know about Backwaters Legacy, Dave, give a quick rundown as to what you guys do. All right. We do outdoor education and youth development. We have a program. We're mostly known for our academy, which is a four-year program, where these kids learn the stuff uh, that we talked about today, plus many, many more stuff from making primitive weapons. Uh, they, they learn every kind of firearm and how to use it. Uh, they learn every type of archery, and we're talking to kids from eight years old. We take kids around eight and nine, uh, depending on if they can stay without mama for a week, <laughs> and then we'll keep them all the way up in, in, until their adulthood. And, and now we've got guys. It's a four-year program, but most of our guys uh, are six years, seven years, and we've got two guys that are at nine years of an optional program. You know, that's learning something, and it's, it's different every year. And we do a lot of stuff that nobody else does. You know, we have we have experts teach whatever their specialty is, you know, in from wilderness survival and first aid to primitive skills, world champion archers teaching the archery program. It's a program like nothing else. I wish we would have had it when I was young because, you know, it takes a, a learning curve. And these kids, 
oh my God, they're going to be master woodsmen and outdoorsmen when you know well before we ever will because of the, they're getting the early age stuff that they're learning at ten and twelve. We didn't learn until we were forty. Yeah, so still it's, still it's learning. Yeah, still learning, and 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 stuff that uh, no one else knows. Bow making, uh, they'll make their own arrows and their own bow strings. We have a falconry program. But we have a program that no one else does. Like, so, uh, we have our own patches. We're like the scouts, but we're better. Uh, we have our own, our, our own, our own patches and awards and certificates that they can earn, and they are earned. They're not given. Uh, we we can. We also can give them their Boy Scout patches and 4 H shooting sports patches. Uh, we take everything to the base. Uh oh, I think we've lost David. He must have hit a tower going into Indiana. Yeah, that, uh, he must have crossed the state line. He's back in Indiana, and they cut his cell phone service off. Right, exactly. Oh, no. Well, it, it's you kind of heard the whole nutshell there of what they do down there. Uh, it's backwaterlegacies.org is their website. Go check it out. you got kids that want to get into that system. Um, I think they're getting ready to open up registration for this coming uh, summer. So it's a great program. And, and the four kids that we had up, you know, that's – they were voted by their peers uh, as worthy to uh, to get a reward, and their reward is to come up and hunt up here with us and, and kill some does. So, uh, before we go though, we did we did have an uh, email that came in. We were talking a little bit about the fact of, of shooting does that might have a little one. And you wanna do you wanna read that email real quick? Yeah, let me bring it up here real quick, and, uh, and we'll try to answer that question. We'll finish yeah, the this show is, with that. Yeah, this was just actually this is right before we were going on. Uh, from a listener from Pennsylvania. Uh, hey, Mike and Dan, UNJ listener from Pennsylvania since the way back old days. Up North Juniors <laughs> pre-pubid, pre-pubitary voice days. That Anyhow. That's back when Mikey was little. Right. Uh, spent, a t- spent the limited time I had to hunt the PA rifle season, hunting for some bucks. I had pictures of and never saw any, but I let all the does I saw walk. I told myself the buck would be following. Right. Maybe I just could not bring myself to drop the hammer on a doe with fawns with her. Mm-hmm. I shoot doe. I've shot doe before where I've lived in the Midwest, and I know there's some QDAM science that says my actions are not logical. Can you guys convince me to attempt to shoot some does in the late flintlock season? Absolutely. Yeah, we we can go down that. And actually, we, we dealt with that. As we talked with Cole here earlier in the show, you know, he had that same mindset, didn't want to shoot a, uh, a doe that had had a fawn with it. Right. You know, he's a, I, I call him tenderhearted. <laughs> and, you know, that was my little little ribbing of him. But, uh, but seriously, though, um, you know, there's people that just won't drop a hammer on a doe for whatever reason. Uh, you know, they, they just can't bring themselves to do it. Uh, and that's fine, you know. And when, when that happens, I, I don't. I don't ridicule nobody. I don't say, I don't call them names. Don't say, you know, you're not, you're not playing the game to try to help deer get better. What we do is let them continue to hunt bucks, and we get somebody, we get enough people to help do what we need to do. Exactly. The, bringing these kids up to our camp. That's one way we try to help the doe population. Do I relish the fact of dropping the hammer on a doe? Eh, I still, I still have respect for the game. My dad won't shoot a doe. Um, I will say when I shot those two in two minutes, the experience alone of that hunt is what made me giddy like a schoolgirl. Right. Still had respect for those animals. Okay. Is it still hard to do? Yeah, sometimes it is hard to do. But in the grand scheme of things, and the thing that we showed the kids when we were doing the field dressing of the deer, first thing we did was we had them get a hold of, of the teats and pull them up, pull that skin flap up. And start taking and, and dressing that milk sack off of the dough. Right. All three doughs were dry. So they were done nursing. If they were they done to. nursing. Yep. So when they're done nursing, those fawns are self-sustainable on the vegetation that's presented. Mama's not going to feed them and keep them alive at this point in the season, okay? What will keep them alive is experience from the mother, okay? I, I will give you that. So if you see a, a single doe with a single fawn, like Cole did at the very beginning of his hunt, he chose not to shoot for that reason. Me, on the other hand, would I or wouldn't I have? It would have been situational for me. Um, I like to see, if I see a doe with a fawn and I'm going to shoot it, I like to see other deer around. So when I take that doe, 
the social structure is that fawn is funneled in with that yep. social structure, family structure of those other does and other fawns. They just, it, it just, they just go on. Yeah. So it's not being left alone to survive by itself waiting for coyote to come up and munch on it. It has that social structure. And we saw that today when we were leaving camp. We're coming out, and we get up close to the gate. And I don't know if you remember, but that, that red pine uh, cutting that oh, we did. Yep. And we got that new growth red pine that's probably four, five foot high. Right. There was nine deer laying in there, okay, all does and fawns. Family group, all together, all inclusive. Now it wasn't one mama doe and all of her fawns. It was nope. it was multiple. So there's multiple families. It's a family group. And that's that's why I look to shoot if I shoot a doe with fawns, I look for it to be in the family structure. Right, exactly. And you know, and and, and uh, we actually had um witness when I was sitting with my cousin Brian, mm -hmm. uh we had one trying to nurse on mom. She kick it off. If, if she if she if she was getting anything, I'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we we don't know. Right. But uh, yeah, it, they should all be weaned off by by November for sure. Right here. Right. So uh, yeah, it, uh, definitely the st social structure plays a role into it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it would be okay to take them. You know where, where we're at and what we're dealing with is we have an exorbitant amount of doe on the property. Our numbers are askew. We've we've done deer counts. Uh, we've got averages for, for the, the piece of property that we hunt that we see on a regular basis. Our food plots are, are just getting decimated. Our browse lines are extremely high. Here's the thing. Okay, so you, at least where we're at, you're shooting does. They got fawns. Fawns are going to survive. Have you ever seen them when they're starving? We have. Yep, not good. We've seen when we get the first green up and things are starting to unthaw and it's not quite green up yet. These deer are starving to death because there's no food out there. There's no food plots. Everything's locked in, frozen in the soil. And they they've eat all the deer browse there is. And now they're eating on vegetation like red pine tops that's not a preferable food source just to put something in their belly. They'll go after the bark, too. We've seen that up here. One of the guys actually watched a doe walk up and eat bark off of a tree. You know they're hungry, then. And it's just like, you know, starvation's gruesome. It is. You know. Mm -hmm. So uh, back in a day, 94, 95, 90, 94, 95, when we had our big kill off in the UP, mm -hmm. um, when it basically in the, the spring talking to the neighbor, he says you could smell death. Yeah. So yeah. Then when you went walking, there it, it would be no problem to find four, six, eight deer all laying curled up together on the side of a hill. Right, right. Just trying to get that warmth from the sun, yep. but it was too late for them. Absolutely. So it was just, but but anyways, Brandon, uh, it, it, if you want some uh, to be convinced, I don't know if there's any convincing, but you got to look at it and think, how's your deer population? That's the first thing you, you know, need to look at. Take a look at your deer health. Yep. What what deer you're you're going through your your wintering periods? Mm -hmm. um, I look at deer density. Yep. For the carrying capacity of the land. Okay, how many deer can that land sustain? Is my deer numbers in check? Is my buck to doe ratios in check? And those are the things. I'm not saying go out and smack does just to, for the sake of smacking does. There's got to be a reason to do it, okay? So, you know, there's areas like in your area. I mean, even though your micro pocket of where you're at, you've got a sustainable amount of does. You're overpopulated. But overall, that general area is down, and they don't allow doe hunting. Right, exactly. Just there's a reason for it. He, she said just north of you in the northern part of the, the county, they won't yeah. see hardly any. Yeah. Whereas we're toward the southern part of the county, we're seeing, uh, actually, they call us the agri car agricultural belt. Okay. So, but, it, but yeah, you got to look at different things like that. But uh, that in itself is a good way to start setting your mindset of what you want to do. I'm trying to find real quick, if I can, before we end the show here, um, the, the numbers I got back from camp. Okay, right here it is. Okay, when I left camp, I think there was six doe that were shot. I got numbers on five of them. One was eight years old. One was nine. One was 12. Another was four. And another one was five. Okay, so that's five deer, five of the six where they got age. I don't know what the other one was and why I didn't get that number, but that doesn't matter. Okay, now, the does that we shot, the one that, Dave, that they've got six, six and a half years old. The one that oldest one I shot, the first one, five and a half years old. The last one I shot, 
He, he said he was in between if it was a year and a half, two and a half year old deer. He said, I don't know. He said, I'm leaning right in the middle. He says, I, honestly, I don't know. He okay. said, the way to get your results back, you're going to know. I mean, yeah, it was, it was a smaller deer. But the point was, um, and, and we've, we've talked about this with our camp manager, it's like, do we take, you know, the, the goal is to get rid of the older group deer of does. Because the older does, the older they get, the more likely they are to produce twin doe fawns. Right. Which throws your, your buck to doe ratio out of whack even worse. Okay. So that's what they want. They say if, if you're shooting, all the does you're shooting, if the average age of the group of does that you harvest off your property is more than three and a half, you're overpopulated. And the, no, anal- he- the a- analytics show that. So and you just saw, you just heard what we've got. Now, there was other deer that were shot after I left camp and got those numbers. I don't have those results yet. Right. But already, five and three, eight deer that we've killed, and only one deer was under three and a half. The rest were older than that. So according to your statistics, you're a little overpopulated. And we know that. You know, the numbers have proven that. So right. well, our deer counts. Your numbers have proven it, and you've, you have visual proof that your food plots aren't growing. Right, right. They're not growing because they're being browsed. They're getting mowed down to the dirt. Yep. yep. So, so, you know, um, don't don't just take what we say here. Um, we've done we've done a lot of reading. I've been to deer necropsies. I've I've learned a lot of this from Dr. James Crow. I've learned a lot of it from QDMA. I've been to a, a couple of workshops at other deer co-ops, and and that's kind of where I've, I've started gaining this this information from. And also what we're seeing on our own property. You know, we're we're managing 640 acres, you know, square mile. Yep. So we're counting 150 deer on average on a square mile. So the average carrying capacity in our area without food plots is 15 to 16 deer per square mile. And you're up at a 150. Yeah, that's a little we, we got food plots, but the problem is we can't produce the tonnage that we need to five sustain pound, that. We, five pounds a day per deer. Per deer. Right. So uh, Kevin Craven chimes in here. Old age does and CWD are why we need to speed up taking more does, in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's a whole other thing—the disease aspect of of what we're trying to do and, and eradicate some of the, like the TB and uh, CWD. Are you going to ever get rid of it? Probably not. It's been around for a long time. You'll, you will live with it. Colorado yeah. is a perfect example of that—that that they've had it for years. You need to manage it. You need to manage it. Yeah. Instead of going crazy about it, mm-hmm. just step back, take a deep breath, and manage it. Yep. So. Those are some of the things that we're dealing with. Um, what was the gentleman's name that emailed us? Uh, Brandon. Brandon. What I would suggest, get in touch with somebody in your area, like maybe your local wildlife biologist. Yep. Ask your, you know what, that is, a, that is a uh, great thing to do. Uh, if you're good with your neighbors, talk with your neighbors, talk but your neighbors. talk with your DNR biologist. He or she will know, and it's really cool, exactly your area. You can tell them where you're at, and then they can tell you. hmm like I found out, you know, she says, well, you're right here, so you're in the agricultural belt. And I kind of looked at her with that look and like, what? <laughs> right. But she explained why. I'm like, okay. Uh-huh. So then we, she explained it. So, yeah, definitely get with the DNR biologist in your area. Talk with them, and they can help you out a lot. Absolutely. You know, it, it, you know, uh, QDMA.org or .com, I can't remember which one it is, but go to their website. Start looking at, at information on, on uh, doe harvesting. Uh, Dr. Grant Woods, uh, the pro- called the Proving Grounds, his, his research that he's doing. Look at Dr. James Kroll and some of the research he's he's done and is doing, um, and just start googling some of these things and, and, and gleaning information and, and start compiling your Absol- own, absolutely your own your, 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 your own, own mind. Make your own call. Yep. We're not going to tell you what to do. It's not our style, anyways. It's everybody. Right. You know, will, will you form your own opinion? You do what you need to do, uh, and. You know what, Brandon, why don't you tune in next week because we will have from uh, MUCC Anna Middling on yep. talking about exactly what we're talking about. And, and Kevin, same thing for you. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, about CWD. Uh, you obviously probably saw our post where she was working in the lab. Yep, she was in the lab where they're collecting. And, and actually, that's where our heads are going. Yep, that's it's where your head dropped off. Yep. So. And so uh, we'll, she's going to be on the show next week at 7 o'clock live, and we can talk to her more about exactly this and what we need or where to go from here. 
Mm -hmm. And she also, uh, one of her big things was saying, get out and talk to your neighbors as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we do. We post everything we do on our co-op page. I got a Facebook co-op page and our surrounding landowners and people that hunt our property and people that hunt their property, we all, we're all on this page together and we all share information. That's, that's the goal. So we, we all know what each other is doing. It, there's none of this, well, hey, that group, they, they're always shooting all the does. You know, they're always shooting. They, they just slaughter. Well, how do you know if you don't? I mean, maybe, maybe it's not them. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe what you're thinking they're doing is not what they're doing. Get with them. Get together. Figure out, you know, what your land management styles are. Figure out what your hunting styles are. Work together. Communication. Communication. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. And Anna's going to talk to us about exactly about that, why a co-op is good. Absolutely. So other than that, um, we're going to break down the podcast right now. We're going to wrap it up with that. We'll take a few questions on the live stream if uh, while we're wrapping up the show. So for those of you on the podcast, as we always say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal. And those of you on the live stream, throw some questions at us. If you got some real quick, we'll entertain some here. Yeah. Hey, uh, Kevin, uh, you still listening? I uh, hope you are. Uh, did you see they announced the uh, Let Them Go, Let Them Grow Summit next year? What's the date? Uh, April. April 14, I think. Okay. Get us some tickets now. And for those of you who don't know what they look like, here's your successful deer hunter patches. I got two. I haven't had one of these in a while because I haven't been able to check my deer in. It's nice. It was it was actually nice to go in and talk to a guy that was polite. He was actually thankful that we came in. He said, I appreciate you guys doing this, bringing them in. I'm like, hey, this is how we make it better. You know, we got to do our part as well. So, you know, take your deer and get it checked. Let them age it. Let them, let them check all the stuff they check. It's, it's for the best. And you're right, Tim. I am not going to let Mike live the bump stack on a muzzle loader down. <laughs> that could. There's more to that story than meets the eye. That is so funny. That just it, it's funny. And yes, yes, Kevin, I will buy you a beer. All right. <laughs> you know, my family being from the South, we may not have won the war, but we know how to shoot and reload. <laughs> right? Exactly. You know. Number one, uh, number one, uh, a muzzle loader must be the number one uh, weapon used in mass shootings. Yeah, we found that out on a couple interviews on TV. That's where that whole bump stock right. comment came from. If you, if you know what we're talking about, uh, it was hilarious. But uh, it was a, it was a, it was a great, it was a great hunt, you know. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to say this because I don't want to thank you. I. I, I want to say this because I want everybody out there that's listening right now to think about doing the same thing. Um, you know, we took them deer back. We had that young fella gut the deer. I shot two deer. That's the first time I've ever not gutted my own deer, ever. I've gutted every deer that I've killed up until this point. And I thought, you know, this kid, he, he comes all the way up here to Michigan. We put him on a stand that didn't produce. Then we put him on a stand he didn't get an opportunity. But he helped gut my deer. I took that small, smaller deer. I, I told him, I said, take that deer home. And that's how you get kids hooked. His eyes got this not, big around. Not just him. His dad, too. His and dad now his, too. his dad told us, he said, man, this was a lot of fun. He says, yeah, I, I can see. I think I'm catching this bug of, of hunting. He said, this is really cool. You know, um, it, that's the things you do to get these kids involved and get them hooked. Right, exactly. So, you know, you shoot a couple of deer, you got extra, share it with somebody else. Hey. You know, right. Take a kid out hunting, you know. Take take an adult out hunting that's never been before. You know. Uh, they're, um, exactly that, because now uh, I've got three deer. Mm -hmm. I had to buy a bigger freezer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Deb asked me, she goes, hey, we got we got some meat. And she knows a, a family. Right. I said, yeah, give, give them some. They, right. ne they never had it. Yeah. So she just gave them a little bit of mountain and just to try it out. Try it. Yeah. And you know, you, it, it's burger with pork, so it, you, it, it a little bit gamey, but it, you just yeah. do it. Spaghettis and chilies, you'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, the steaks, you know, if you need any questions, just ask. So, uh, and if you know, maybe we'll give them some more. But we right. gave them a little bit just to, to help them out, and uh, whatever twelve pounds of meat they gave them, uh, it just. That, that helps so much to give them that. Last week's show, I know the audio 
I know we had issues with audio on the live stream, and I apologize for that. We're working, we're still working through a couple little things here. We're trying to make the show better. Um, we're, we're working on some equipment, trying to get some things a little more interactive. But what I want to say is that show, if you remember at the beginning, I recorded that question and answer period from Dr. Sh uh, not Dr. Mahoney, from, from the conservation of Shane Mahoney. And he said, one of the things about the hunting community, uh, about the, the giving and the sharing of our bounty and, and helping other people and giving them wild game, sustainable meat that, that sustains your life. And I'm not going to get all mushy here on you and, and, and go no. tell Ted Nugent, but you understand what I'm no, saying? No, exactly. Giving, and, giving something you've taken and harvested and sharing it with and other sharing people. And sharing it. That's, man, that's that's in our DNA. That, that's what know? we do. It, it's, I'm not going to hog it all. Right. It's just, it's like, hey, yeah, hoard it. And then you got a whole freezer full of fish that's buried in ducks and geese and deer meat. You know, it's the bottom of the freezer. It's freezer burn. And you it's know? three years old. Yeah. You know, turn that stuff. Give it, a, give it away. You can't, you know, I'm telling you, when, once you start doing that, it's powerful, man. Right. You, powerful. And you're right, Kevin. Um, the DNR has made it harder to check the deer with disease becoming more prevalent. It needs to actually be easier. Absolutely. It, 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 it's kind of going backwards, isn't it? It's, you know, and I am absolutely totally shocked that you told me that the check station was open today. It was. I was blown away. I, when I pulled up, it said, the sign said open. I'm pulling up to it, you know, driving down the road. I'm like, well, it says open, but did they forget to flip the sign? Right. And then there's another little sign that said uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, 10 to 3. That's their hours. Okay, so what do you do between Tuesday and Friday? <laughs> now, there's people that take a week off and go up muzzleload hunt. Not a lot, but there are people. So you want cooperation to make it easy for people to take it in. Now, there was a guy there. As soon as we got done, a guy had a bag, and he had a deer head in it, and he brought it up to d drop off. Okay. Now, if, if you, that's if you've got a place that you can do that nearby. If not, what do you do? What do you do here? That, see, that's where you got to go. you got to hope that this check station over in the next county is open and drive over there. Right. I mean, it's not it's not horrible, but, it, you know, you take, you know, an hour of your day, make a round trip, go do it and bring it back. And if they're not open, you're, you're kind of hosed. <coughs> right. You, you know? Right. And you're supposed to freeze it until you take it over there, yada, yada, yada. So. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So. Nope. Don't worry. There'll be, obviously, with Anna coming on next week, it'll, we'll be talking more. Absolutely. Uh Matter of fact, Kevin might be interesting. I want to talk to him, matter of fact, because I think he hunted the Northwest 12 this year. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll talk with him some more. Um, but, uh, yeah, with Anna coming on, and we'll, we'll, we'll get her we'll get her spin on it because she doesn't work for the DNR. No. She works with. Co cooperatively with the DNR. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be interesting to get her take. Yeah, and then what happens in the lab when those deer heads go in? What happens? She was there. Is they were bringing them in and doing their thing, so we're gonna get that. Insight. I saw a couple of them wearing breathing apparat apparatuses. Yeah, wonder what, what that's all about. I, I want to ask her. I saw that in right. a picture, and I, went, I gotta ask. So yeah, we'll get the answer this coming week. Yep, exactly. All right, folks, we're gonna wrap up the live stream. Y'all take care. Thanks for joining, and uh, thanks for watching. And uh, we'll be back again next week. Y'all take care.